Hi, I'm Dr. Simon Fry, the consultant in clinical neurophysiology. Welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'm following up the last one where I talked about febrile seizures um, and now thinking about how seizures manifest themselves with age and therefore what that might mean for the future as well. We're thinking about epilepsy, we're thinking about seizures, and we know that these are manifestations of either abnormal excitation or reduced inhibition or some problem with the connectivity within the complex structures of the brain. And we know very well that there are multiple causes. There's no single cause to explain everyone's particular um, form of seizure or epilepsy. And the risk of having um, epilepsy or seizures actually differs with age. We know from large epidemiological studies that the risk is the highest in the youngest of age groups, it's the lowest in the middle ages, and then creeps up again as we get older. And the reasons for this will actually be reflective of the underlying causes of the seizures. So these all differ by age. So preterm babies, will have different causes to elderly people. So preterm babies may have issues like hypoxic ischemic encephalopathies, hemorrhages that may predispose to seizures in the neonatal period. Yes, some of these things may be sort of uh, genetic benign, but they may, may also be structural, metabolic, uh, have some other genetic causes. In the childhood years, uh, we've already talked about febrile seizures, there are infections, we have childhood absence epilepsies. In the teenage years, we need to start thinking about the juvenile myoclonic epilepsies, juvenile absence epilepsies. And then as we get more into the adult years, we lead more adventurous lives, there are uh, traumatic brain injuries to think about, infections, autoimmune problems, tumors and in the elderly populations we need to be thinking about the most common causes which are cerebrovascular diseases neurodegenerative states and again also tumors too so there are lots of different potential causes they manifest themselves at different ages in different ways and so the risk changes accordingly now in terms of measuring the prevalence of epilepsy it's actually quite difficult the definitions of epilepsy, the definitions of what a seizure can, comprises of uh, will very much vary uh, between uh, healthcare providers. Um, the types of health registers that are kept are quite varied. They're not necessarily um, regional or national. And often we're relying on old data and from studies done elsewhere. I'm not particularly interested in what happened in Rochdale in the 1990s, to be honest with you, and I'm sure that you're not particularly interested either. I want to know what's going on in my area in the recent past and try and understand what might happen in the future as well. So um, there are you know, methodological issues with anything, but we need to start thinking about perhaps alternatives to these very large, um, very labor and cash intensive um, ways of health register uh, studies. So one way I was thinking of doing this is actually by looking at EEG referral counts to departments. Now, um, EEGs are obviously specialized tests. Um, we hardly ever use them for screening purposes. Of course, in the airline industry, that's something else. But in terms of my uh, laboratory, my department, um, it's very much um, on the whole in response to an event and that event tends to be something which might be query a seizure, query uh, epilepsy. They are occasionally used for other reasons too, um, you know, for example, cognitive um, aspects of dementias and alcoholic liver disease and so on. But, you know, by and large, the vast bulk of EEG referrals that come into my department at least are in relation to a specific event which have a particular probability um, of reflecting a seizure. Now, obviously, events may not be epileptic. People can have syncope, they can have a drop in their blood pressure. Doesn't mean that they have epilepsy or a seizure. They may have a cardiac arrhythmia. Again, doesn't necessarily mean that they have had you know, a seizure as we're referring to it. And of course, even amongst those who have undoubted epilepsy about 30 to 40 percent will have a normal EEG so merely you know having an EEG does not mean um, it equates directly to epilepsy but there's certainly a relationship between the proportion of people who have an EEG and those who have had a seizure 
who, who do have an epilepsy. So it's an imperfect but an indicative tool, certainly in terms of trends. And this is really what I'm talking about, trends. So here in Luton, over the last six years, um, we have seen about 10,000 EEGs, and this is the distribution of them. And in the uh, blue bars over here, these are the absolute numbers. Uh, the red line is the percentage. And you can see that 6%, um, in fact, um, of our EEGs are done in the under twos. And then that sort of drops down all the way to uh, the centenarian group. Now, that in of itself is kind of helpful but we need to know what it's in relation to the population how do we do that so we have the office of national statistics and in fact you know they um, have their responsibility uh, to work out how many people there are in the country really important to plan services plan your tax plan your pensions and so on so the government take a very interested role i should say in understanding what our population is like at the moment and what it will be projected to be in the future as well. So looking at um, the demographics, you can actually look at the whole of the UK. You can look at just England over here. So this is uh, the one on the left and on the right over here. I've actually buried it down to uh, the Luton area, which is where my department is situated. And you can see that my um, structure of the age demographic is a bit different to uh, England, we have quite a large base over here of youngsters um, and those um, in their mid to late 30s. And um, in the older age brackets, we seem to have a little bit less compared to England. In fact, the average age of people in Luton is about 37, which is younger than that of England. And now if we plot the percentage by age, that's this low one over here, against our EEGs, we now have a much better idea of where these EEGs are coming from in relation to our population structure. So about 1.5% of our local population is under the age of 2, and interestingly, that's producing the 6% of EEGs. There's another little spiker here um, of about the age of about um, 3, another one about the age of 7, another about the age of 18, and then it drops down again into the over 70s bracket over there. This is an another way of looking at it. Um, it's just a subtraction, really. So you can see over here, these are where the referrals come from in the younger ages, certainly the under twos, this next split over here, and then the age of about seven, 17, drops down to the mid 30s, crawls its way back up again, and then in the over 70s. So we can see very clearly where the EEG work is coming from, but actually it very much is, ties in with what we already know about the risks and the epidemiology of having epilepsy and actually validates this as a tool for looking at trends in where seizures and epilepsies, the age groups that they are occurring in. What we can also now do, using the Office of National Statistics, is now try and model forward and see what will happen in the future. And uh, of course you can have a look at um, these and it plays very nicely um, in terms of how they all uh, works out. So here we go, I'll just uh, put the play on this. And you can see very nicely how the different um, ages are expected to change in terms of the brackets as time shifts forwards. Very mes mesmerising and obviously a lot of work has gone into that. Now what I've done is I've extracted that data and that's been quite painstaking um, but um, what you can see over here is uh, the red line here is the 2025 projection and the green one here bright green is a 2030 projection and you can see how uh, the age bumps are changing over the course of time and so we're going to have more in the 14 to 18 bracket over there more in the mid 40s more in the uh, mid to late 60s as we go forward over the next 10 or so years and Based on that, we can actually work out the risk of having an EEG and work out what the risk of having an EEG will be in 2025 20, uh, and 2030. And in fact, interestingly, the, the 2025 and 2030 are actually quite similar in many ways. That's the red and the green lines over here. And you can see there's a 
a drop here in the youngest of ages, an increase up um, around the age of about 17, um, and again in the mid 60s and, and late 70s. Another way of looking at it, same data once again, just tidied up in, in a way. Uh, this is the percentage changes, and you can see here that group increase at the age of about 16, 17, mid 40s, 60s, and 70s. Now, I've cut off the latter part of this because um, the actual number of EGs in the oldest age groups reduces down quite significantly to you know, just a couple of digits worth, um, and therefore it becomes quite inaccurate and everything gets quite wild. Um, so I'm just ignoring that bit of it, but um, certainly I think these parts are quite robust. This is just mapping it against what the population looks like. Uh, just to show you, um, this is the bump in the population here in the um, sort of mid to late teens, mid 40s and 60s. And you can see how that correlates with what we predict in the future. What does it mean? So for our younger age groups, paediatrics, we need to think about having dedicated services and support for teenagers, how we reach out with them, how we support them through their schooling, through their university, and of course how we transition um, our kids and our young adults into their future too. There's a lot of work that has to happen in those periods. So we really have to target services to help those particular patients. In the middle ages, um, our neurology colleagues we expect to have more work on their hands. If we're having people having more EEGs done in their mid-40s, it's indicative of there being more complex causes of uh, seizures and epilepsy. They'll have their hands tied with investigating those. In terms of the older patients, actually, if we're trying to reduce the risk of epilepsy, then we need to be targeting the causes, the cerebrovascular diseases, the neurodegenerative diseases, and looking at risk factor uh, modification, blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, lifestyle, all these important things. Now, obviously, we want to reduce those important conditions in of themselves, but in terms of the epilepsy risk, these will be things that our GPs need to be thinking about. In terms of applicability, I've shown you what it looks like for Luton. Um, obviously, the exact numbers will depend on your local demographics. Our demographic is different to the rest of England, although it's a changing demographic and things are expected to change in slightly different ways to perhaps other regions. But either way, this is a national issue. We've got an aging population. An aging population means that we need to be thinking about the impact of different diseases affecting older people in every age bracket in different ways and addressing them on the national scale and in fact wherever you are in the world on a global scale we need to be thinking about this and I think this is actually a very useful exercise in using data to model the future of our healthcare needs and how to move things forward so I hope you found this interesting um, I've certainly found it interesting trying, trying to model this all out um, and please do show your support for the channel by hitting that subscribe button down below uh, always happy to take questions uh, nothing personal for for anyone though of course um, and um, wishing you only the very best of health and looking forward to seeing you in the next video all the very best